Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Unger. Dr. Unger is the Chief Scientific Officer at Fluidon. Mark. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, CIRM for having me here to speak. I think I probably have a lot less experience uh, overall applying for grants uh, than, uh, than Eugene did. Uh, and uh, because of the danger of, uh, of, in, of uh, extrapolating too much from an n equals one, mine is a little bit more in a, uh, a travelogue uh, format, which I hope will be uh, somewhat entertaining. So I'll tell you a little bit about, about, very little bit about the technology in order to set the stage for how we came to apply for uh, the grant in the first place, a little bit about the people, uh, the idea, how we refined the idea and turned some things which were uh, essentially um, probably going to be weaknesses into what ultimately became, I think, strengths in the ultimate uh, application. And uh, a few words about the, the grant application, how we did it itself, and uh, then just a few words of advice. So technology for our, that where we, where we came from is we were able to make these very small valves in silicone rubber, roughly the size of a human hair. And, you know, when you apply pressure to the top one, it squeezes the roof shut on the bottom one. This, this is a world's smallest and simplest microvalve. And uh, this is relevant because it enables us to do a lot of integration, which we've done over the years. First chip from 1999 was, you know, roughly eight valves. Ones we've made more recently have about 30,000 valves uh, and are much more, uh, much more sophisticated. Uh, and while we were doing this uh, in terms of uh, making chips denser and more, uh, and more integrated, uh, Steve Quake at Stanford was, uh, was making a chip to, uh, to uh, hold and dose and manipulate stem cells um, in his lab. So it turned out that this was sufficiently interesting to, uh, to other folks in the stem cell field that uh, uh, Stengent, our collaborator, uh, came to Steve Quake and said, we, we were interested in this, you know, what we would like to do, and he referred them to us as the, as the company. And, uh, and we were off to the races. And it was pretty, pretty clear that this is uh, useful uh, as a, a tool uh, for stem cell researchers. So it was pretty clear that we would fit into the tools and technologies um, uh, uh, RFA uh, pretty well. So that was clear from the outset. So we, at this point, we had you know, folks from Fluidime uh, who were very good at, at uh, chip design and the, uh, basically making the interface to these chips and doing the hardware and the software. Uh, we had the folks from StemGen who were very good at the stem cell biology and understood those things. Uh, and then we had folks at Stanford who had had the previous experience of actually making a chip to uh, grab stem cells and dose them with things and manipulate them, including Steve Quake and the, the two, Anne Leirad and Rafael gomez Gilberg, who were the uh, two first authors of the paper. Uh, so, you know, our first idea was, you know, with the technology, as, as, uh, as, as I showed, you can use this technology to make a chip to manipulate stem cells. And we went, I think, for a time with our collaborators at StemGen, we sketched a lot of things on the board and said, hey, well, what can we do with stem cells that would be really interesting? We could sort them, we could partition them, we could culture them, we could dose them, we could export them. What, what should we do? So we sat around for a while, we sketched out, we brainstormed many different things oops, that we could do, um, and ultimately, kind of came to the conclusion that the Quake Lab had really already built the, uh, a chip that had approximately the right functionality, that would be the most, do the most good for the most people. So that's a problem. Uh, how, does one, how do you go about writing a grant? You know, you know, why, why would you write a grant to do something someone had already done? You know, the combinatorial, combinatorial dosing. And, and we sort of realized that, well, you know, why did if that were true, if it already did what it was supposed to, why did StemGen come to us asking about it? The answer is that the real problem is that the stem cell community, despite the fact that this paper had been published, still didn't really have access to the technology. So what was missing? Well, the people didn't, in the general community don't know how to make these microfluidic chips. They don't know how to do the, they don't really uh, know how to do the control hardware to do it. And the, uh, the IO complexity of putting the chip all together was, uh, painful and difficult, there was a barrier there as well. So uh, we realized, you know, if you look at, the, look at this, the, the, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the chip in the upper left-hand corner here. This is 71 fluidic connections and 49 pressure signals. That's very painful for, uh, for someone who's not a microfluidics expert to do. But we realized you know, this, solving those problems essentially is system commercialization. That is something we have done before. Fluidum has done a lot of it. We know how to manufacture chips. We know how to do the I.O. and we know how to do instrument design to make all those things work. So we took this 
a sensory problem, which is that um, the, uh, the, the relevant design has, has since, since already been executed on and turned it into our strength. We, we took the, said, okay, well, we're going to take this and we're going to make it more commercial. We're going to make it, put it in a space where it's available to the stem cell community. Uh, so that led right into, you know, what are our specific aims? We want to scale up the technology into a manufacturable form. And because th this had not done, been done so much in the original paper, we want to demonstrate its use by reproducing stem cell literature results. So we're not trying to innovate. We weren't trying to innovate on the biology in particular for this, but rather take the technology and turn it into a manufacturable form and demonstrate its use uh, doing experiments that other people have already done. Um, so at this, at this point, we, we had all that done. That seemed very straightforward. It seems that playing to our, playing to our strengths, ours and those of Stengent. At that point, we realized, oh dear, this is due very soon, right? The, uh, um, uh, the, the application is due quite soon now. And uh, that's not a good thing in terms of your application process. You should not aim to not have enough time. Uh, mm -hmm. But it did lead to something which I think was useful in the application process, which was that we were, by necessity, forced to keep it simple. And uh, the fact that it was simple made it clear. And so we had to, had to do that, sort of clutch play, and we, and, we, and we did that. So by simple, what do, what, what do I mean? So what's not simple is a page of text. A page of text, there's a lot of words in it. Someone has to read them. They're going to get tired. Uh, simple, simpler than that, many things are simpler than that. A bulleted list, a Gantt chart, and pictures are all simpler than that, and they also make it more clear. So, for example, the Gantt, the Gantt chart we put into the uh, put into the grant proposals looked like looked like this, and I, I mention this for two reasons. One is this is easy to understand. If you if you're a reviewer reading this, it's easy to understand what roughly what we're going to be doing, how long it's going to take, and when we're going to be doing it. But the other part of it, the part that reflects back on the actual doing of it, is that it doesn't start this way. Right? This is what you end up with after you do the first couple passes at it and realize that there's things out of place and that don't make sense and that you have to fix them. So this not only makes it ultimately simpler for the viewer to read, actually the, the, the doing of it makes it uh, uh, more clear to the people who are actually going to have to do it. So you simplify and, and uh, make it work better that way. So when I say pictures, you know, one of the points that we intended to make um, in, in the doing of this was that you know, we had experience making uh, things commercialized, bringing them to a commercial level, bringing them to the level where other people could use them. And we could write a page of text on that, but actually uh, pictures like these actually do a much better job of, of, of conveying that. You know, hey, look, these are commercial instruments that we have built and produced for people. This is a commercial chip that we have, uh, commercial chips that we, we, we produce and we, we make for people. So those pictures actually are worth, I think, arguably more than a thousand words of, of equivalent text in saying how, uh, how, how we can do these things. So the advice, um, play to your strengths. Uh, so the things, and by, by strengths I mean the things that you are better at than anyone else in the world. These are the things you really want to have front and center for your application. And we, as I said before, you know, we, we ultimately had a, had a what would, what would would have been a weakness had we tried to make improvements upon the existing chip and then have to explain to a bunch of people who are not uh, microfluidic specialists and shouldn't be <laughs> um, why it would be better. Rather than do that, we said, hey, we're going to do this and scale it up and commercialize it, which is something we were demonstrably you know, had done and were better at than anyone else. Um, and the other thing is if you're missing a strength that's important to the proposal, collaborate with someone who has it. It's not okay to not have the strength. You have to have to have it get it from someone. And in this, in this case, you know, if StemGent had not been involved, the grant proposal would never have been because we didn't know the stem cell biology well enough to target the grant proposal well enough without them. So that was, that was important, very, very important that we had them uh, on the team and with us uh, in the making of the thing. And the second is keep it simple. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One is for yourself because if you can't say it simply, it probably means you don't understand it well enough yet. If there's too much, too much detail, too much complexity, you probably haven't thought it through well enough. There's an old saying from uh, the military, I believe, which is, uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy. <laughs> Things are going to change once you get in the thick of it. If your plan relied upon a great, you know, uh, spaghetti code of, of, uh, of, uh, of detail, 
it won't work. <laughs> so essentially, if you can't make it simple, you haven't thought it through well enough yet. And the second, and for this probably more, more germane one, is for the uh, reviewers, simple means clear. So they can understand easily what you meant, what you plan to do, and roughly when it will be done. Uh, and that, that makes, should make their life a lot easier and thereby, I think, make them much more likely to, uh, to say yes. So acknowledgments, uh, the folks at StemGent, uh, our collaborators, uh, Steve Quake, uh, our Flutum and the Flutum coworkers, uh, and Lanrat came over from, from, uh, from Stanford to help us in the project. And of course, CIRM for uh, providing the money and for having me here today. Thank you.